Oh, well. Okay. So today we're going to do Sutta number 52, the Atta Kanga Gara Sutta. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Venerable Ananda was living in a town near Vasali. Now on that occasion, the householder Dasama had arrived at, oh man, Patsaliputta for some business or other. He went to a certain monk in Kukuta's park after paying and after paying homage to him he sat down at one side where's my oh there it is and ask him where is the venerable ananda where is he living right now i wish to see venerable ananda Venerable Ananda is living in a village close to Vesali. Then the householder Sadama had completed his business in Pateleaputta. He went to the Venerable Ananda in the village. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side. Venerable Ananda, has any one thing been proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened, wherein, <coughs> excuse me, if a monk abides diligent, ardent, and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated, and his destroyed saints uh, taints come to dis be destroyed and he attains a supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before yes holder householder one such thing has been proclaimed by the blessed one what is that one thing ananda here, householder, quite secluded from sensual, excuse me, from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. He considers this and un understands it thus. The first jhana is conditioned, volitionally produced. That means he's pointing his mind to stay on the object of meditation. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. Standing upon that, he attains the destruction of the taints. Any time you get into any one of the jhanas, you don't have any hindrances arising. So your mind is very clear. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, then because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in a pure abode and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. This is one thing proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees accomplished and fully awakened, wherein if a monk abides diligent, ardent, and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated and his destroyed taints come to be destroyed and he attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. Now in the Angutra Nikaya, in book number four, Section 123, 
124, something like that. It talks about uh, a Sutta Gama Gami? Ajanagami, that's what it is. And anytime you get into one of the jhanas, you have the potential to attain Nibbana and get off the wheel of sansara. So, <clears throat> one of the things that I I've tried to encourage you for the last month or so is taking care of keeping your precepts without breaking them. And with your daily activities, be in a jhana. Now, if you can do that, the Nibbana can happen to you at any time. While you're uh, mopping the floor, or while you're doing your wash, or while you're doing any other mundane kind of thing, if you can stay in the jhana, you'll feel your mind all of a sudden go very deep. And you stop what you're doing and just sit down for a little while and watch the show, see what's happening. So you can attain Nibbana while you're taking a bath or um, cleaning something up or doing some other mundane kind of thing. This comes from having a pure mind. This comes from keeping your precepts without breaking them. Now, one of the real advantages of keeping the precepts is your mind will get concentrated very quickly. That's one of the advantages of this. And with that deeper kind of awareness with your daily activities, you can have Nibbana happen at any time during the day. An awful lot of people have this idea that the only time you can attain Nibbana is while you're sitting in meditation. And that's just not quite true. That idea came from people that are practicing one-pointed concentration. They say you can't get into a jhana unless you're sitting very still. But that's not what is called full awareness. If you're just doing it while you're sitting and then forget, forget about the meditation while you're doing your daily activities, then you lose that concentration and hindrances come in. So you really want to try to keep your practice going with your daily activities. Now, sometimes you have expectations and you expect uh, that your mind is going to get to a certain place and then you just let it be there and don't, don't go further. But when you stay in the jhana, then you're not going to have any hindrances arising. And you actually become much more efficient at what you're doing while you're doing it. And you have some joy there and you feel very comfortable while you're doing it. So you don't have emotional things that, that, that would come up and distract you away from the uh, 
the hinder, uh, distract you away from being in the jhana. Now, I had a, a discussion with Venerable Punaji, who was one of my teachers. And he, he'd been going around saying, the first jhana is nothing. You can't attain Nibbana by just being in the first jhana. And I showed him the sutta. And he stopped doing this. He stopped talking that way. So this, this particular sutta, it's, it gives you a clear idea of what a jhana actually is. Now, before I was starting to talk about getting mastery of a jhana, mastery of a jhana means that in the blink of an eye, you can go from just regular mind to jhana mind. And you can hold it for as long as you, uh, as, as you, as you can. Of course, it takes practice. And it, it is a pretty exacting kind of way of practicing the jhana. So you make a determination how long you're going to be in the jhana. And then you get into the jhana and you stay there for that length of time, say, 14 minutes and 31 seconds. And then you try to come out at exactly that time. And you do it often enough in, in say, one sitting, you can have four, four or five times you can go through that, or six times, however long you're going to sit. And what you're doing is training your mind to stay with your object of meditation. And gaining mastery means mastery to go into the jhana, stay in the jhana, and pull out of the jhana at exactly the, the time that you allot for that. And when you can hit it five or six times in a row, then you can start extending the amount of time that you work with the mastery. After you hit that five or six times, your mind really does start to expand and understand more of what you're trying, your, your purpose is. So everybody that gets in a jhana is called a jhana gami. And gami means attainer. So you're a jhana attainer. But when you come here and you do a retreat, I don't really talk about what jhana you're in until you start getting into the arupa jhanas, which happens fairly quickly, to be quite honest. When I first became a monk in the 20 years before that, uh, I was always told getting into a jhana, it takes a long time. And there was one monk that he became very, very popular in uh, Thailand. And he could sit in the realm of nothingness. And there was this ooh-ah feeling around him that, oh, he's somebody that's really, really special. But now, a lot of my students go even beyond that. So it's, it's pretty amazing the uh, 
ideas that people have about uh, the different kinds of jhana. Uh, I know there's one teacher that says there's not two different kinds of jhana. Well, there actually is. Because one is an aware jhana, the other is a one-pointed jhana. And the one-pointed jhana, you can't carry it with you with your daily activities. You can't be walking around. <clears throat> when I came back from Asia in, I guess it was 98, uh, I got mocked quite a bit because people said that, no, in, in the Visuddhi Maga, it says that you have to be sitting still. And I kept on saying, you can be in a jhana, you can have equanimity for long periods of time while you're walking from one place to another, while you're doing your other daily activities, you can still experience one of the four lower jhanas. So, <clears throat> again, with the stilling of thinking and examining thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence. And very strong joy and very strong tranquility and happiness. And you're able to stay in that jhana for a longer period of time. He, he considers this and understands it thus. The second jhana is conditioned and volitionally produced. It's volitionally produced because you're, you're pointing your mind that way. You're, you're making up your mind that you want to get to uh, that jhana. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. Standing upon that, he attains the destruction of the taints. Now, one of the things that can happen in any one of the jhanas is when mind is ready for it, you will be able to feel your mind go very deep. And then you will experience a cessation. Okay. Now you don't know you're in that state until you get out of that state. You don't know how long you sit in that state. And when you come out, you have some sharper awareness. Um, some people, even in the first jhana, when they experience that, and then they get into a cessation, when they come out, they can see some of the links of dependent origination very clearly. Doesn't happen for everyone. It depends on the condition of their mindfulness. Now, when I'm talking about staying with whichever jhana you want to be in at the time. When you hit the cessation, you are becoming more and more clear. Everything around you is more clear. Your understanding of how your mind works is more clear. Your, the joy you experience, the awakening factor of joy is a happy feeling, but it doesn't have the excitement in it 
that you have in the lower jhanas. And actually it doesn't fade away. That feeling of joy doesn't fade away, but you get so used to being in that state that you don't notice it as much. At first it's gonna be pretty exciting, but after a period of time, you can still have the, that joy, that uh, happiness, and full understanding of how this process works. It, it becomes more clear, more alert, brighter. And things look more vivid, more, uh, more 3D-like. And colors become much more vivid and alive. And you start to feel things uh, in a different way. Um, you get around some plants and you can, you, you can all feel the color coming out at it, uh, coming back at you. You can be standing beside a tree and you can hear the tree sing or you can hear the tree talk. And this happens with a quiet mind that is an uplifted, happy mind. And I know that I get criticized because I say, you can, you can hear the, uh, the trees, you can hear them talking among themselves. And I've had students that they thought I was absolutely crazy to do that. And then they come out here and they hear the trees talking. The American Indians, they talked a lot with the trees. And a pine tree, if they were emotional about something and they were troubled, they would go sit and put their back against a pine tree and that pine tree would take that sad, upset feeling away. So there's all kinds of different ideas about this sort of thing, but the American Indians were real smart about that sort of thing. They were in touch with nature much more than we ever will be in this kind of culture. Anyway, you can experience a cessation anytime your mind becomes quiet. And it can be a very active time with your body, but all of a sudden your mind says, oh, we're going to take a few steps down and calm down. And then you can go sit someplace by yourself without getting disturbed and watch what's happening with your mind. And the cessation can happen at that time. So this too is one thing proclaimed by the Blessed One, wherein if a monk abides diligent, ardent, and resolute, he attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. Again, with the fading away of joy, a monk enters upon and abides in the third jhana, which has equanimity, balance of mind, and full awareness of things around them. Now, a lot of people that are doing one-pointed concentration, they'll say, well, you lose your body at the third jhana. And in a way, it's true. What happens when you get to the third jhana is you stop noticing things in your body as much. You lose feeling in your hands or you lose feeling in an arm or a leg for a period of time. 
And if you put your attention on your hands, you will feel your hands. But when you stay with your object of meditation, you just don't notice what's happening in the body. And you'll go along for a period of time and you'll start losing more and more feeling in the body as long as you don't pay attention to it. And the feeling that's in your heart will move up into your head. This is a good sign. I had one student some years ago <coughs> that was so attached to the idea that they were supposed to have that feeling in the heart that when the feeling went up in the head, she started fighting it and she pushed it back down to her heart and she almost drove herself crazy, but she wouldn't tell me that that's what she was doing. So that was a problem. When she finally told me that's what she was doing, I, I told her in no uncertain terms to stop, stop resisting what's happening with the meditation. Your job is to observe. You're not, your job is not to control. That's what the definition of mindfulness is all about. It's your observation power of how mind's attention moves. And when it doesn't move the way you want it to, now you're fighting with the truth. Because the truth is when your mind wants to do something, it, it will try to do it. So you, you don't use the six R's as some kind of club to beat your mind back to where you think it's supposed to be. You allow that to be there, but you don't keep your attention on whatever is distracting you, even though it's a feeling of loving kindness. You don't hold on to that feeling. You don't try to expand that feeling. It'll expand all of it on its own when you're doing the practice properly. So it's pretty amazing to watch uh, how some people resist because they have this idea that mind is supposed to do this. And I've been sitting so long, I, I get into a habit of just going so deep and then not keeping your resolution, not keeping your uh, mindfulness and awareness. You just get caught in that feeling. And you can get stuck there for a long period of time. But when you're practicing six R's, not as a way to control things, but as a way to observe things, and you don't keep your attention on your distraction. You stay with your object of meditation. Then your mind will all of a sudden one day you, you get used to being, oh, it just goes this deep and that's what I sit in for a period of time. And then I get up and walk away and do other things. I had a student in Indonesia for three years. She would sit every day. She had it in her mind that she needed to sit for one hour and she never extended that. And for three years, I did everything I could to get her to stop doing that. Well, she said, after I sit for an hour, nothing is happening. So I got, I got things to do. I can get up and walk away and start doing the, these other things. And finally, I had to threaten her with my walking stick. I said, I'm going to hit you the next time you 
don't go beyond an hour. And she finally heard me. And all of a sudden she was going so deep, she just came to the interview and she was just shaking her head. I can't believe how much deeper I'm going. I see what you finally are you're you're telling me about. And I told her that every time I saw her for three years, and finally she heard it when I threatened to, to hit her with a stick if she didn't uh, follow the directions that I was giving her. I was tired of it. And her progress in meditation was fantastic after that. I mean, it was, she really, really did well. And she got to the third stage. She got to become an anagami. But she just had this idea that the meditation is supposed to be like this, and that's what I'm going to put up with, and any anything other than that, I'm not going to mess with it. Well, uh, now I bring it up anytime in Indonesia. I bring I bring her situation up just to impress on everybody else that, that there's more to the meditation, even if you've had an experience of becoming a Sotapanna or a Sakagami, there's still more to do. The Buddha had 45 years of telling people the same thing over and over and over again. He had magnificent patience. My patience doesn't last so long. So I threaten. <laughs> anyway he considers this and understands it thus this third jhana is conditioned and volitionally produced but whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent subject to cessation Standing upon that, he attains the destruction of the taints. Again, experiencing the cessation. That is the true destru destruction of the taints while you're in that state. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, become an arahat without ever returning from that world. This too is one thing proclaimed by the Blessed One, wherein a monk abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. He attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. Each level of jhana is a learning level, and you're teaching yourself continually by letting go of your old experiences, not making a big deal out of whatever has arisen. The second step of the, the six R's is release. Release, don't keep your attention on anything that calls your attention to it. Just let it be there. Then you relax. And when you relax, you're letting go of that craving. And now your mind is pure. So you don't have uh, the clinging and you don't have the habitual tendency and you don't have the birth of other kinds of action. And you don't have Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. You let these go. Now, some people say, well, how do you... Uh, I just had a member of the family die. And I have a lot of grief and I have a lot of sadness. What most people do 
when they have this kind of experience is they fight with that feeling. They, they don't like that feeling. They indulge in that feeling and they claim it as theirs personally. Now, from the studies done with uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, she says that if you resist and try to push away those thoughts and feelings, even though they're, they're coming up often, if you try to push them away, you're going to have some kind of physical illness within two years of the death of that person. And I've seen it happen a lot. I've seen people that they are in a state of depression continually, not liking that, that their loved one is gone and they can't talk with them anymore. So when I was working with hospice and I was working at the nursing home with people that were dying, I also worked with the families to teach them that just because a painful feeling arises doesn't mean you have to make it go away. There's pleasant feeling and there's painful feeling. And it's all right for either one to be there. It has to be all right because that's the truth. When that feeling arises, if you make a big deal out of it and fight it and try to push it away, you only make that pain bigger and more intense. You have to allow that feeling to be there. It's painful. Yeah, it is. And it's okay for it to be painful, but you still relax. Light, try lightening your mind just a little bit, not making it some kind of big, like some kind of joke, but lightening your mind. That's what the smile is for. Well, I don't feel like smiling. Don't care. There's a lot of studies that are being done on smiling right now and how that changes your perspective. Even when you don't feel like smiling. So I tell people to do some things when they have a, a loved one die. One thing I have them do is have a, a nice picture of that person that has died and talk to them. Tell them how sad you are and, and how you, you miss them being around. Also, I've, I've had people sit in front of a mirror and smile even when they're sad. Now your mind can take off and try to try to tell you Oh, my face is ugly when I'm smiling and I'm not really very good. You six are that kind of um, perception. The nature of the sadness that occurs when you're a loved one dies and you truly do feel sorry for that. The nature is that it will eventually get less and less. And then it might be a month or two months or three months. It's not quite so bad. And then you'll get hit with it all of a sudden. You'll get hit with that sadness and that frustration and anger, whatever the whatever grief that arises. Everybody is looking for reasons that it happens. And uh, that's what a lot of religions talk about, the reasons that it happened. Well, God called me. 
and I'm supposed to, I'm, I'm in a heavenly realm and, and I'm in a better place and all of these kind of things. But when I give you instructions in loving kindness, I tell you one of the things that has to happen is that you send loving kindness to a person that's living. Now this is for the meditation only. If you have sadness coming up, you can send loving and kind thoughts to the person that has gone away and wish them well. Now, the reason I tell you not to do that while you're at a retreat is because you need to have that person alive and that energy, the, the life energy is there. But that doesn't mean that you can't send loving and kind thoughts to someone that has passed. You just won't be able to get into the jhana. So and how many times have I given you the definition of compassion? It's seeing someone else in pain, allowing them to have their own pain and love them without any conditions at all, wishing them well. Now you can do that for people that have died and they can feel that and they will appreciate that and they will help you as much as they can even though they're not in a physical form anymore. So when, when you're getting into a jhana and you can stay in that jhana with your daily activities and a big shock of somebody that dies that you were very close to and you weren't prepared for them to die, it can knock you out of the jhana because your mindfulness is not so good at that time then you use your compassion and send them loving and kind thoughts and send them to yourself and send them to all of the family members. Remember, you never have to be hopeless or helpless. There's always something that you can do that can help other people around you. <laughs> and people that have left this plane. So that's how you overcome grief. And grief can be any, any number of different hindrances. Some people, they get angry. Some people, they feel guilty because they didn't do or say something while that person was alive. There was a, a lady that I knew that she, she was staying with this friend. And she was always with her. And she had to get up and go to the toilet. And she came back and the friend was dead. And she felt so guilty because she wasn't with that person as they died. What's there to feel guilty about? Really, you do better by sending loving kindness to all of the relatives that are suffering. There's always something that you can do and say and the way you can be that helps other people around you. That's part of the practice, isn't it? I mean, that's the whole, whole reason that you wind up looking for peace and calm. That's why you come to, uh, to Buddhism. 
I, when I came, finally found Buddhism, I was in a state of depression all the time. Not happy. And I was suffering so much, I started telling myself, there's got to be something better than this. I, the life is not worth this. And I tried being doing the Christian way and praying and that sort of thing, but it didn't, didn't really suit me very well. So when I started hearing about meditation and uh, it's supposed to bring you peace, then I started really getting interested in um, learning how to let go of the, the depression. I was extremely shy and I spent a lot of time by myself, but always looking for an answer. I, I wound up reading all of the, the great philosophers of our times in the great books. I read all the great books and all of these different philosophers had all these different ideas about life and how to live it. <clears throat> but that wasn't very satisfying. That was only intellectual knowledge. But the beauty of Buddhism is that you are your own teacher. And it's not intellectual knowledge that you learn when you are practicing meditation. It's practical. You get to see how you cause yourself suffering. And you get to see the different things that you can do to help overcome that suffering. So the whole idea of overcoming the taints, destroying the taints. You do that little bits at a time. That's what the third noble truth is about, right? Letting go of the suffering. The more you practice your mindfulness, the more you practice staying in a jhana while you can, and never criticize yourself because you don't do it in exactly the same way every time. Then you can teach yourself some brilliant things. And those things that you learn for yourself, you can be an example of how to overcome suffering for other people. Now, the big thing that was going around when I was first learning about meditation, everybody wanted to become a teacher. And being a teacher is uh, it takes a certain kind of person to be a teacher, to be able to explain things so that people understand it. So you can use a language that's not highly intellectual and still get the idea across. I ran across a thing in a Reader's Digest. It was an old one. It was like from the 60s or something like that. <coughs> And it was talking about the simpler you keep your language, the easier it is for everybody to understand it. And then they did a, an example. They didn't use a word, uh, they, they didn't use any word that was over four letters long. And as soon as I read that, I understood exactly what they were saying. And that's one of the, that's one of the goals of being a teacher is to be able to explain things so that people 
really do understand and they can try themselves. To be a teacher, you need to be able to repeat the same thing over and over and over and over and over again without losing your enthusiasm. To be a teacher, you have to go through your own experiences and be able to explain those experiences to other people in a way that they want to try it. So this goes all the way through all of the the Rupa Jhanas, the Arupa Jhanas, and is basically saying the same thing that uh, this is uh, this is volitionally produced. Why is it volitionally produced? Because you're you're taking a conscious effort to point your mind to that object of meditation and then use the six R's to continue on with it. And you have to learn to develop your own patience. That's another thing with being a teacher. And I had this stuffed down my throat by Usilananda because every day I, I was I was in, I was patient. I was patient as long as I got what I wanted when I wanted it. But when it didn't happen, I'd get impatient. Jeez, I wish you'd hurry up and get here. So he was continually giving me that lesson over and over and over again. And eventually I actually heard what he had to say. That's why the repetition a lot of people don't like to read the suttas because it has so much repetition in it. But you have to understand that you have to hear things at least three times before it starts to sink in. And that's how the Buddha was so, so brilliant about things because he could explain things that and it repeated over and over and over again just like the the six sets of six. There's some people that listen to it and they're bored by it and they let their mind go away. I feel sorry for those kind of people because they're not actually hearing and putting into use the lessons of that sutta. And that sutta is very, very powerful. So this particular sutta goes through everything up to cessation. Cessation is not volitionally produced. It happens when the conditions are right. And like I said, you don't have consciousness. And because you don't have consciousness, you're not aware of things around you. You're not aware of anything that's happening with your body. You're not aware of anything that's happening with other things around you at all. So, The suttas on the, uh, the Janagami, one of the things it says is that if you become a Janagami, you'll be reborn in a heavenly realm when you die from this realm. And from there, you will attain arahatship.
and get off the wheel of Sansara, which I'm looking forward to. I think that would just be great. So, okay. I've been talking for a long time. Now it's your turn. Do you have any questions? <coughs> Fang, you have a question? Sure is quiet. Uh, hello, Bante. <laughs> hello. Yes. Uh, Bante, I got this question. Uh, uh, you have to turn the, the microphone on. Okay. How about now? Wait just a second. Okay, try again. Yeah, uh, my question is related yeah. to uh, nutrients. I don't hear you. Uh, my question is related to nutrients. Do it some more. Uh, oh. in the, 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 yeah. Food. Now I'm starting. Now I'm beginning to hear you. Yeah. So uh, what was my, your question? my question is related to nutrients. Uh, when in, in Samadhi Sutta, it says there are four kinds of nutrients. Uh, and the first one is uh, physical food, like palpable food. So my question is like, if, if there is an Arahant, uh, does it mean that Arahant doesn't get hungry? No. They get hungry. They eat food. Okay. But the nutriment that they were talking about was um, uh, before, right before contact. Contact is a kind of nutriment. Okay. And that means that you're making a big deal out of whatever arises. You're keeping that contact as soon as it happens. Then you make a big deal out of it and it sticks around for a long time. So you need to let go of that. Let go of that contact. Let, let go of the formations. and stay with your object of meditation and the letting go of the hindrances. Okay? Bhante, uh, I, I will ask another question. Okay. It's related to jhanas. Uh, like, for example, uh, if someone is in fourth jhana, and mind automatically switch to fifth jhana, that happens. And uh, in that case, uh, can I say something like he does not explode everything in fourth jhana? Maybe he not necessarily. Does. See, when you when you're practicing, uh, you're, you're practicing mastery. You make a determination to go no higher than the whatever jhana you're doing. So you're training your mind to be able to go to that jhana and you're not going to experience any of the other jhanas. It will just automatically go to that jhana and stay with it as long as you make the determination for it. Okay. Okay, Bante. Uh, those two are my questions. And okay. one, one more thing is uh, Happy New Year, Bante. Oh, thank you. And you too. Thank you very Keep much. Smiling. Have fun. <laughs> thank you, Bante. Okay. Hi, Bante. Hey. How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks. Good. Yeah, I'm a beginner of twin. And uh, I, yeah. I, I do have 
some question on the practice. I think the biggest trouble that I have, uh, I when I meditate, I have the pulsation sensation on my hand. Okay. Yeah. So, so what do you do with that? Uh, I, I, so I listen to your talk a lot. So maybe not a lot, maybe in the past months. I do understand from your talk. So I think I took, uh, I made a big deal before and I took it <laughs> personal. Uh, it all makes sense to me, but when I practice, not have trouble to do the relaxing step. Oh, you so have when to I try that. to relax, I feel nothing. And sometimes when I try to not try, when I see to see if what I can feel, it makes sensations stronger. You're trying too hard. You're oh. not smiling enough. You need to improve your mindfulness. Okay. And you have to let go of the expectation that whenever I use the relaxed step, it's going to feel really relaxed. You have to let go of that idea. Sometimes you might have to do the six R's uh, five or 10 times before you actually feel the relax, but you're relaxing every time. You just don't feel it. It's not as big as you think it's supposed to be. And then you get frustrated and you're, you're with the frustration, then you're not on your object of meditation. And then you have more and more emotional. Exactly. And that, that's a problem. So you're trying too hard. You know, when I give a retreat, I always tell people they have to smile. They have to laugh. Laugh with yourself for trying too hard. And you have to have fun with it. You're over serious. You have an expectation that you want it to be in a particular way. And it's not going to be like that. It's going to be different. So let go of your expectation and relax into it and just have fun. Just kind of make it into a game. Okay? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it sounds easy, but it looks uh, to me. So if I don't know how, what's the feel of relaxation, how can I do that? My Omar you will improve your mindfulness and you will see for yourself. Remember, you're teaching yourself, but you're indulging in your expectation of what you think it's supposed to be. And you have to let go of that. Okay. And smile more all the time. Okay? Okay. And be lighter, be lighter with your expectations. You don't know what it's supposed to be, so you kind of project the way you think it's supposed to be, and when you don't meet that expectation, then you cause yourself more and more suffering. And that's funny in itself. So laugh with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay, good. Bhante? Yes. Uh, hi, Bhante. Just had a couple of questions. Um, okay. So, uh, so in this sutta, it uh, seems to imply that um, if you have uh, reached the arupa jhanas, uh, then you're automatically uh, you're no longer uh, born into human and uh, in, in the human form, uh, and that you're essentially. Um, destined for, for uh, Nibbana. Right. Um, and also you had said at the end of the talk that uh, if you uh, ever, ex if you experience a jhana, then you, um, it, it, you're not going to deteriorate from that state and go back to... Um, right, you'll be reborn in either, either Deva Loka or if you go further than that into the other, uh, into the Brahma Loka. Uh, right. So, 
so th does that then imply that if you uh, attain any jhana at all, then that you you've automatically become a sotapanna after uh, because of that experience? Uh, you have the potential to become a sotapanna. Right, but it is still possible to to um, to lose uh, to, uh, to lose the progress that you've made and and no, it's such a wholesome state getting into that jhana. The first jhana is is amazingly important. There, there's three three different places that are amazingly important in the progress. The first is getting into the first jhana. It's such a wholesome state that you can never do meditation again, but on the deathbed, you're going to remember that joy and that's going to elevate you to a deva loka or possibly it depends on what you do with the meditation. I see. Now that, I see. That's, what, that's what Usil Ananda has told me many times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just had uh, one other question. Okay. Um, which uh, which is re which is related to my practice. Okay. Uh, so I uh, so last week when I was uh, here, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I um, I had quite an interesting experience. I don't know exactly whether it was a jhana or not, but it was certainly different from anything else that I had experienced before. Mm -hmm. um, but since then, um, it, so what I've, I've experienced in my life is that when uh, the outer circumstances are good then uh, my mind settles down very easily and I'm able to meditate for longer periods and become more concentrated. Good. But when, uh, but when there's something stressful or something that requires a lot of attention that I need to think about, then uh, my practice kind of, uh, it's difficult for me to, to keep the concentration okay. and the- you, you, you would rather think about and indulge in rather than stay with your object of meditation. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I mean, I, um, I probably. Not probably, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a trap that we all get caught in. I, I can laugh because I've been there. I, I've had the same kind of stuff happen to me. So I can laugh with it and it's, it's like one time you have a really good sitting and then you get up and you walk and you come back and you start telling yourself you want that sitting to continue now and be as good as it was and you, it never happens. Yeah. It's because you put in too much energy, you put in too much effort. Right. And that stops you from getting into that quiet space that you had experienced that you want. Mm -hmm. and that's when you really need to develop your sense of humor about how you're causing yourself all of this suffering and right. laugh with yourself. Right. And then you smile more and lightly Start again, lightly. Right. Um, everybody I've, that does any meditation at all has the same experience like that. Right. Uh, I think I've also seen that uh, doing things like singing or uh, engaging in some kind of service to other people uh, can also help. Oh yes. But. That's, that's what I, I'm trying to get you to, to help other people by being an example. And by being an example means helping other people overcome their suffering. Right. That's a great thing to do. Right. 
Um, well, uh, thanks very much, Pante, and um, I'll I'll be back uh, to get more advice. Come and visit me when you can. I I will definitely do that this year. Okay. Thanks very much, Pante. I I, I look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Bon oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Whichever. <laughs> How are you, so Sophia? I'm doing very well, Bante. Thank you. You have a good Christmas? Yes. Very restful. Thank you. You know, it's really kind of amazing. This is the first year I've been here in the States for Christmas in 10 years. Oh. And when in Asia, oh, and it's just another day. It's like no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> we had some snow here, so it was very, very beautiful white Christmas. <laughs> oh, God, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it was just enough, just a little powder. So, <laughs> yeah, so that, um, that really makes it feel like Christmas, right? Yes. <laughs> So what did just, you have to ask? Yes, I was just curious about what you mentioned in your talk today about being able to hear the trees talk. Yeah. And I was wondering two things. One, what do they talk about? And two, can they talk to you or can you talk to them? Well, I hear them sing when, when it's uh, uh, raining. They get real happy when I'm training. <laughs> and they have they have fears and anxieties. They hear somebody is like uh, I have a neighbor that he is uh, or he was a, a lumberjack, so he was cutting down trees all the time. <clears throat> and I had this man that he didn't believe in in talking trees at all. And he went out walking where this lumberjack had, had looked at these five trees that were nice and straight and they were big enough around to chop down. And he, he was talking about that with somebody else. And when my friend went up near these trees, <coughs> he heard them say, please don't cut us down. Mm. And he came running back to me and his eyes were about that big. <laughs> and he said, do trees really talk? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, well, they talk to me. I said, what did they say? And they said they didn't want to get chopped down. So I went to the neighbor and I told him, please leave these trees alone. <coughs> and then I had, I had the, the man go back and tell the trees that it was safe, that they could have a happy life. And they thanked him very much. Wow. That's trees, wonderful. <laughs> the, the, the thing with talking with trees is you have to have a very quiet mind. And you can ask them questions. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me, I have something caught in my throat. You can you can ask them about uh, what the weather is doing. Or is it time to go to sleep yet in the winter? Mm -hmm. They will they will sleep when it gets cold. Mm -hmm. And in the springtime, they they feel all energized. I'll talk to you about that sort of thing. But you have to just quiet your mind when you're when you're around them. And if you have an emotional problem, go sit by lean against a pine tree. Mm -hmm. You'll see. The American Indians were amazing with that. They they were so in touch with the land. Mm -hmm. 
mm. that they they learned a lot. They learned a lot by talking to different plants to see whether they were edible or not, or they were used for medicine. Would one's mind have to be really trained for something like that, right? It seems like... Uh, quiet. Everybody... The meditation I'm teaching you, when you get to a certain place and your mind is quiet, you can start hearing them. Now, not everybody is, is able to do that. It depends on their sensitivity to feeling. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Monte. <laughs> <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year Happy to New you. Happy New Year, Monte. <laughs> Hi, uh, Bonte, can you hear me? Okay, sure can. Oh, cool. Um, so I'm having one of these trying too hard experiences that I hope you can, you can maybe help me a little bit with. Okay. Uh, I talked to David recently about this, and I've been doing the forgiveness meditation for a few weeks now. Uh -huh. And I've learned gradually that I was kind of saying the phrases a bit too fast. I was correlating them with the breath when I shouldn't really have been. Right. And that is is improved, but I've noticed now that it's become a big distraction for me. In that, when I do the out breath, I feel almost as a cue to relax or a, a cue to say no. the phrase. And don't yeah, no, I'm just asking you: uh, should I just ignore that? Should I do it? You should I ignore. Really you should ignore the breath completely. Okay. You're just distracting yourself. So forgive yourself for being distracted, relax, and start again. Okay, so ideally I should not even know, like my problem I guess is that you I'm don't aware, pay don't pay attention. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay, I guess, I guess that's it. All right, okay. thanks. Uh-huh. Hello, Bonnie. Hey. Hi, Bante. Thank you for your talk. Hi. You said earlier that the jhana of cessation was not volitional. So does this mean that... It is, it is volitional. It's that you, you're pointing your, to your mind towards an object of meditation. That is volition. Right. Including the jhana, the cessation of perception is also volitional? No, that happens by itself. It's not volitional. Okay. So does this mean that someone who is at neither percep perception or non-perception might be there for a long time until... It's still, happens? you're still holding on to an object of meditation, even though that object of meditation is quietness. That's still volitional. It's with the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. That's not volitional. That happens by itself. So someone in, in neither perception, there's nothing for them to do. To there move is up. something for them to do. They're staying with the quiet mind. They're watching the quiet mind. That means it's volitional. And then you just, just wait until the non-perception happens. Well, if, if you're waiting, then you're wanting it, and that doesn't work so good. So you just <clears throat> you just observe. Just keep observing until it happens on its own, when conditions are right for it to happen. No matter how long that takes, right? Well, that's entirely up to you and your mind. Is your mind pure enough? See, when you get to that state, you have an exceptionally pure mind. You don't have any distractions. Your mind is completely clean. And you keep relaxing 
if there's any kind of disturbance that starts to come up. So you're, you're experiencing as, as pure a mind as a human being can have before they attain Nibbana. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Bhante, and Happy New Year. Oh, thank you, and same to you. Hi, Bhante. Hello. I, on the back of uh, <clears throat> the previous uh, question, um, when you're practicing in um, your previous state of mind or a state of jhana would be, let's say, jhana seven or eight, when you go back and do the daily life and come back the next day, you may not get to that state of mind or jhana. You won't, you won't get to that. This is with the four lower jhanas that I'm talking about. Okay. Being able to walk around and be in. In, in terms of the practice, <clears throat> when you do seed meditation and when, when I do that, um, of course, one day, you are there, but next day you go back to daily life and you come back at night and want to sit and um, the mind either is busy or it doesn't get to that estate. Um, do I need to go from the first jhana or I just practice? No. It may get back to that jhana or not? No. When people get into the Arupa jhanas, I generally recommend that they do, they start with loving kindness. And when they get to the loving kindness, their mind will settle down and all of a sudden it'll jump to equanimity. And then it will go to cessation or the, not cessation, but the uh, neither perception nor non-perception, but it'll do it all on its own. So what I generally recommend is start with the metta and let it let mind do what it's going to do. It might jump all the way to the cessation. It might jump to uh, infinite space. Doesn't matter. Let your mind do what it's going to do by itself. Remember, you're just there to observe. You're not there to control. Right. And for instance, if there is kind of like exceptional day or the, the work is hard and sometimes it doesn't uh, even go to deeper state. Yeah. Just, yeah. But you start loving kindness, you're, you're going to get to that pretty quick. Okay. And that would be a starting with a spiritual friend and in six directions. No, 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 no. the six directions. The six directions. Okay. Right. The other question I have is that in some of the texts, sutras, they talk about four jhanas, some others, they talk about eight. Do they basically combine all the first four and also the, the fifth jhana in one jhana when they talk well, about four jhana? You, you have to understand that the Buddha... When, when he's talking about the Eightfold Path and he talks about right concentration, he's always talking about the first four jhanas. The fourth jhana has four parts to it. They're different states. I don't give those numbers. I, I generally say that it's uh, infinite space, infinite consciousness, joy, or equanimity. But I don't give them numbers. That's okay. an American way of kind of fouling up things. And it, it gets confusing. Right. So when the Buddha talks about four jhanas, so the, the fourth jhana is basically contains three or four arupa jhanas, or the last one is arupa jhanas. Right. Right. Okay. There are different levels of equanimity is what it be, be, really boils down to. Okay, got you. Well, one last question. Okay. Um, when you want to practice the, the mastery of jhanas, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between the 
first or second or basically the uh, the the body jhanas. Um, Not really. Okay. You're learning. You're learning about the jhanas all the time. In one mm -hmm. of the suttas, uh, Sariputta stayed in meditation all day, and he was coming back to his his hut. And uh, sorry, uh, Ananda saw him coming in the distance. And he went up to Sariputta and he said, Bhante, your, your countenance, your, your very, uh, very bright and you're very clear and you're very composed. What jhana did you sit in today? And Sariputta said, I sat all day in the first jhana. Right. And the next day he comes walking, walking back from his daily sit. And again, Ananda said, you're, you're radiant. You really are very beautiful and uh, very inspiring. What jhana did you sit in today? And he said, well, I sat in the second jhana all day. Now, when you're doing mastery, you will see the difference very clearly between the first jhana and the second jhana. Okay. And you're teaching yourself a lot of lessons about each of those jhanas, how you can get into them, how you can practice them. But generally, in order to get into the jhana, you just bring up the feeling that you experience in that jhana, and that would be the object of meditation? Um, when you're when you're getting into mastery, you you have to. Let's say you're just doing it to the first jhana. You're doing it for fifteen minutes at a time. You make a determination not to go any higher than the first jhana. Right. And when you go through all of the different stages of the first jhana, then you make a determination, now I'm going to go no higher than the second jhana. And you do that for 15 minutes, a half an hour, and an hour. And you hit that, those. And then you go to the third jhana and you do that again. And then the fourth jhana. You can right. do the arupa jhanas if you want. But they're a little bit more difficult. <clears throat> but... Is there an object for each of those? Let's say if you sit for 10 minutes and you practice determination, yes, I guess the ob Yes, of course. And the object would be the feeling of the first jhana, I assume, if you want to go to the first jhana or the, well, the feeling of jhana. Right. You already know what it feels like. Then you try to get in. At first, you're not going to even get into the first jhana. And then you, you'll, you're teaching yourself all the time, and then you start hitting it now and then. And then it starts, you hit it closer and closer to the time, and then you continue on. Right. Thank you so oh. much. Okay. I have more questions. I don't know if others have questions. I keep asking questions. Oh, that's fine. You keep asking <laughs> questions. That's fine. Sorry. Um, don't be sorry. Be happy. <laughs> sure. Um, when Buddha talks about the uh, Eightfold Path, um, the right. right mindfulness or the wholesome, the, um, the harmonious mindfulness, he talks about the four foundation of mindfulness, the body and body feelings and mind and object of the mind. Um, in this meditation, I assume we don't need to focus on each aspect, but the major question is that how do you meditate mind in the mind and what he meant by mind? Because I guess object of the mind is... talking about getting in and out of the dramas. 
Okay. The whole thing is the foundations of mindfulness. It is about a jhana practice with insight. Right. So there is no need to individually practice on each foundation of mindfulness. No. Okay. That an awful lot of people get confused about that. Well, I'm going to take mind as mind as my object of meditation. See, the whole thing is those four foundations. You got to feel all of them. You got to see all of them. All right. the time. Okay. They're, they're not divided. Well, I'm just going to yes. walk feeling. If you don't have a body, how do you have feeling? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, uh, had troubling uh, with distinguishing between each, of course. There's right. the whole body and mind. Yeah, great. Right. Well, thank you so much. Happy New Year. Wish you the best in 2021. Thank you. And you Thanks. too. Thanks. Thanks. Any other, Hope to see you soon. Do you have any other question? Not now. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> have a good one. <laughs> okay. You too. Thanks. Bye. Anybody else? Okay. Let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.